mini lecture on stress. Um, earlier in the module, we described different types of stressors, those that are um, hindering or harmful, which are called hindrance stressors, and those that are motivating uh, stressors, which are called challenge stressors. So what we will see now is that these stressors can occur both uh, in the workplace, but also take place outside of work. So we have this sort of two by two box where we can have workplace hindrance or workplace challenge stressors, as well as non-work hindrance and non-work challenge stressors. So in this lecture, we're going to work through um, each of these different types of stressors, and I'll provide you with some examples. So we're going to start by talking about work-related hindrance stressors. So these are going to be experiences or, or factors that occur in the workplace and are harmful for employees. The first type of work-based hindrance stressor is called role conflict. And this occurs when an employee holds multiple roles in an organization and these roles tend to interfere with one another. So um, generally speaking, role conflict arises when uh, we have to have um, when we have to meet different expectations for different people. So imagine that you are that rope in this picture and you are being pulled in different directions by different people. That is really what role conflict feels like. So when we're talking about role conflict, we're talking about conflict within a role. So thinking about your job as an employee or thinking about your role as a student, um, what different expectations might you experience that leads you to feel stress? So I'm going to give you some examples here. Um, for instance, if you are an employee or have ever been an employee where you had multiple supervisors and each supervisor had a different expectation for how you should complete your work or a different expectation about what your job duties were, this would result in role conflict because you might not know which supervisor you're supposed to listen to and that can create a feeling of stress. Um, so again, if you're working in an organization where you have different supervisors, maybe a morning supervisor and an afternoon supervisor, and they each have different ways of doing things or expect you to complete your job duties in different ways, you might not know which one of those people to listen to or how to make them both happy. Uh, that creates this feeling of conflict. This might also occur if you are in a position in an organization where you are representing both customers and the company. This happens a lot in customer service roles or in sales roles. So imagine that you are a sales uh, representative and basically customers are looking to you to give them the lowest rate that you can offer while your company is looking to you to maximize profit and to make the most money possible. Uh, these are conflicting demands, right? Each person wants something different from you and it's going to be very hard to offer customers a very cheap rate while also providing the company with profit. And again, this can put you in a difficult position um, of being tugged in separate directions. Uh, perhaps you've never had work experience, uh, but you are a student and you might actually be feeling this role conflict right now if you are enrolled in multiple classes. So you have different classes, each class has a different uh, professor, and these professors tend to have different expectations of students, uh, and often professors want you to dedicate full time and resources and focus to their class, and it can feel as though um, Everybody is demanding your time, and so you're not sure which class you're supposed to prioritize in your role as a student because everybody wants something from you, and it's hard to address uh, each expectation, right? So essentially, role conflict creates this feeling where it's difficult to please everybody um, that you are expected to please because there are different expectations for you. The second type of work-based hindrance stressor is called role ambiguity. And this occurs when there is a lack of clarity around what one person is supposed to be doing. 
So according to role ambiguity, employees are going to feel stress when their job duties are not well understood. So if you've ever worked in a job where you're supposed to be doing something but you're not sure what it is, uh, you're experiencing role ambiguity. If perhaps you haven't been given enough guidance or instructions on how to begin, uh, that also can create stress because it, you're really not sure what direction to go in or how to even get started on a project or on uh, a job responsibility. Role ambiguity can also occur when there's a lack of information about performance expectations. So if you don't know what it means to do a good job, if you aren't clear on what you need to do in order to perform well, that can also create role ambiguity. Uh, so for instance, if you don't know what your manager wants from you, uh, or you're not sure how to get a good score in your performance evaluation, you're probably experiencing role ambiguity. Students also experience this if there isn't any feedback given about their assignments, or perhaps if there's no rubric used when grading assignments, uh, it can create this feeling that they don't really know what to expect or what it takes to do a good job. So as managers, the more information we can provide about um, how to do a job as well as our expectations for what a good job looks like, uh, the more likely we are to reduce this feeling of role ambiguity. Role overload is the next type of work hindrance stress, and this occurs when someone feels as though they have too many roles to complete. So there's just too much work to do in order to get it all done. So we might say this uh, in an informal way that someone is just wearing too many hats at work. They have too much um, to do, too many responsibilities. Um, oftentimes role overload occurs when an employee doesn't have the skills uh, to complete the work or perhaps they don't have the resources to complete the work. So if you typically manage a team of interns, but during COVID-19 you're unable to hire those interns and now suddenly your workload is, has tripled, um, you might be experiencing role overload. Or perhaps um, somebody has left your organization and you now need to take on and cover their job responsibilities until you've filled that role, but you don't actually know how to do their job, uh, that would be a lack of skills, you would experience role overload. So essentially when an employee has so many tasks and they really don't think that they're able to complete all of those tasks, uh, that would be an indication that they are feeling overloaded, simply having too much work to do and not enough time uh, to complete it. Finally, the last type of work-based hindrance stressors is called daily hassles. Now, you might remember that we talked about daily hassles when uh, we were covering content in chapter four. In fact, daily hassles is part of affective events theory. So you'll remember that when an employee experiences a daily hassle, it leads to negative emotions. And then those negative emotions affect their job performance and their citizenship behaviors and their uh, job satisfaction. So daily hassles, again, are just day-to-day -day nuisances, things that get in the way of employees being productive. So when an employee experiences a demand that interferes with their ability to do their job, kind of holds them back, gets in the way, um, creates barriers, that would be a daily hassle. Uh, so examples would be just unnecessary obstacles like having broken equipment. So if your internet constantly goes out or your webcam doesn't work or the printer is constantly on the fritz, all of these would be obstacles you have to face that just make getting your job done uh, much more difficult. Perhaps you have an annoying coworker who just talks to you all the time and you can't get any work done because they're constantly talking. Or, uh, which seems to be more frequent, uh, especially during Zoom days when there's just useless meetings, right? If there are me people are meeting and nothing's really getting done and you could be doing other work, but instead you're just sitting at a table or sitting at your computer and basically not getting anything done, um, that of course can take away from employees. Or perhaps there's tedious paperwork where you have to fill out a whole bunch of forms and nobody reads the forms or doing the forms really doesn't have a purpose. All of these would be daily hassles that employees have to endure and simply by enduring them it leads to feelings of stress over time. 
Employees can also experience work-based challenge stressors. There are three types of these, and remember, challenge stressors are motivating positive types of stressors. So the first type is called time pressure. So with time pressure, the idea is that we assign deadlines uh, to employees in order to get work done. And by having this upcoming deadline, it motivates the employee to get the work done because they know they need to have the work completed by a certain date and time. Uh, generally speaking, as the deadline gets closer, we feel more and more pressure and it forces us to get work done. You might feel this way in some of your classes or even in this class with the week to week assignments where each week you open up the module, you know what you need to complete, but perhaps you don't really feel pushed to complete that assignment until the deadline is approaching. Uh, that is what time pressure does for us. So you might imagine that during the work day, maybe your boss you know, comes up to you and says, hey, we have this new client and we need to create a proposal for them and they need it in 48 hours. So now you're under a time crunch and you have to get that work done. Uh, it's motivating. It forces you to take action and get the job completed when you don't feel like you have a lot of time to do it. The second type of work challenge stressor is called work complexity. And essentially, this is the idea that we are engaging in work that is forcing us outside of our comfort zone. It's stretching our abilities so that we can develop new skills and new abilities. So essentially here we're giving employees a job or a task to do and we're challenging them to develop new knowledge, skills, or abilities. So this will push employees beyond their limits. And it's important to note that we want employees to grow. So if they're doing the same work day in, day out, um, that is not going to allow them to grow. So we want to give them new challenges to keep the work exciting and interesting, um, and also to create some of that motivating stress. But uh, we don't wanna push them too far. So you'll see in this graphic, there's this comfort zone that's not really a motivating place. Um, so we wanna be pushing people into that sweet spot of the learning zone where they're developing new skills and they're being able to challenge themselves and, and take on new projects and, and push their abilities. But if we push them too far, they're gonna be in that panic zone where uh, they feel suddenly like they don't have what it takes to do the job and they don't even know how to get started and maybe they feel like it's not a good fit for them. So it, it really is trying to find this sweet spot where you're stretching employees to, to try new things and develop skills without um, putting them in a situation where they feel as though they lack total competence. The last type of work-based challenge structure is called work responsibility. And this has to deal with the extent to which someone's job or job responsibilities are really important either to the organization or to society at large. So for instance, if somebody has a large number of tasks or a broad scope, they do a lot of different things for their organization, that can create a sense of, of stress and create a stressor because lots of people are counting on them. So um, for instance, in our department, we have an administrative assistant um, named Kayla, and she just is so, she's responsible for a lot of different things and everybody goes to her when they need help and she always knows exactly where to point somebody and what direction to point them in. And so Kayla probably feels a little bit of stress because everybody's counting on her. Her job is, is important because of the number of things she does and um, the scope of her work. So she really is an integral part of our organization. So even though she feels um, very important, that importance can lead to a feeling of, of stress. It can also happen when we have um, accountability for other people or for very critical tasks. So for instance, if somebody is an air traffic controller, that's a really important job. If, if you fall asleep on the job, all the airplanes could crash, right? And so that can create a stressor that's motivating to perform well because you understand that there are some critical tasks that need to be performed and that you're your job performance uh, really has um, implications for other people. Uh, an ER doctor, a firefighter, all of these would be jobs that really entail critical tasks that um, could involve the well-being or endangerment of other people. And so doing those jobs suddenly becomes very important uh, and motivating, but also can feel a little bit like a stressor. 
Okay, so now we're gonna move into the non-work stressors. Uh, there are three types of non-work stressors. The first is work family conflict. So work family conflict essentially says um, individuals have responsibilities inside the home, but also in the workplace. And sometimes these get in the way of one another. So this type of conflict can occur in two ways. One can be work to family. So this is when somebody's work responsibilities get in the way of trying to complete their family obligations. So if you have to work overtime and therefore you miss your child's um, sporting match, that would be work to family conflict. Or perhaps you have to meet with a client and as a result you're not able to be at bedtime or you miss dinner uh, with your family. All of those would be examples of work to family conflict. But there are also times when people experience family to work conflict, when trying to meet the responsibilities of your family interferes with your ability to get the job done. So for instance, if you had a child who was sick and needed to stay home from school and now you have to call off from work, that would be an example of family to work conflict. Or if you had a weekly meeting um, with your team but it took place at 3 p.m. and that's when you need to leave to go pick up your child from daycare, that would be an instance of family to work conflict where you're not able to do your job responsibilities because of some other obligation you have in the family realm. The second type of non-work hindrance stressors are called negative life events. And with negative life events, um, basically these are anything that would that happen in your personal life that um, could create stress for an employee. So perhaps you have um, a diagnosis, some kind of health condition that impacts your day-to-day -day well-being. Perhaps um, you are going through a breakup. Um, perhaps you uh, are having difficulties um, you know, with your landlord, any kind of event that's going on in your non-work life uh, that does create um, a burden would be considered a non-work um, negative life event. The last would be financial uncertainty. And so this occurs when individuals aren't sure if they're gonna be able to pay their bills, if there's concern about um, their paycheck. Uh, this can really create an, a burden on employees and really be taxing for them very, uh, and lead to a great deal of stress. So whenever an employee isn't sure about their financial situation, if they have a lot of credit card debt or student loan debt, um, it can certainly impact them day to day and, and take away from their ability to focus on on things in the workplace, even though this is a non-work based um, stressor. Out is a non-work challenge stressor. So these are going to be things that happen outside of the work environment that are motivating or exciting for individuals. For instance, um, family time demands occur when there are events or situations that might be coming up that um, motivate an employee that um, are exciting even though they might create some um, stress in the meantime. So for instance, imagine that someone is going on vacation. It might take a lot of preparation to try to get everything in order so that they can leave. So building up to the vacation um, might take some of their resources and can create this um, the stressor, even though it's motivating and, and for a good reason. Uh, we might also feel this way leading up to the holidays where there's so many things that we feel like we have to do and, and the holidays are an exciting time and there's a lot of happiness um, uh, surrounding that time, but it does create a sense of pressure as we have things that we need to complete um, outside of work. The second type of non-work challenge stressor is um, what we would consider personal development. Uh, so this would be anything that someone is doing in order to challenge themselves. So um, an employee might decide to undertake a new um, training program, perhaps they enter into getting a master's degree or some other kind of certificate. Uh, so this does create a motivating type of stressor where the employee is bettering themselves and so there is a lot of um, positive emotions and excitement surrounding that development. But of course, it does take time and, and resources in order to engage in that personal development. 
And then the last type of non-work challenge stressors are positive life events. So this would be anything that's occurring in one's non-work life, um, but does have a positive impact. So you might think about um, for yourselves, maybe upcoming graduation, perhaps um, planning a wedding or the birth of a baby or the adoption of a child. All of these are events that are are positive, they enrich our lives, they're exciting, um, however they can become a stressor as they require our time, they require our attention in order to um, really see them through. So again, these are positive, but they can, of course, um, create a stressor for